a, a promoter, if you imagine that you've made a promoter 10 times stronger, um, you have increased the amount of RNA by tenfold. Um, but RNA is not your final product. And so you can, you can tune the level of RNA. And in fact, you have a, a certain range that you can titrate that. Um, but if you want to be able to change the protein concentration, um, the ribosome binding site strength is actually able to affect translation over a 100,000 fold range, which is a, a wildly powerful range um, of, of different expression strength to explore. Um, so, so that is really interesting because you could imagine then that you could have made your, your, your same amount of RNA or 10 times as much RNA, but when you have another knob downstream that can, can amplify that by six uh, orders of magnitude, then, then maybe that's the one that you should focus on. Um, so commonly, um, you, you think about changing your promoter actually for transcription factors, for, for inducing um, certain phenomenon, for, for biosensing, and that'll be really the subject of, of next time. Um, and then you, you can commonly focus on your RBS for, for controlling expression strength. Um, and another reason why you might need to do that is if it's within an operon. So, so this actually aren't even all the reasons to think about RBSs. Um, they're, they're smaller, as we'll discuss soon. And uh, again, they can be part of this operon structure, at least in bacteria. So what does that mean so in terms of more practical implications? If you've got a plasmid, Say here, it's this p -Seva plasmid. This is from a paper that's on a preprint um, server, so not yet peer-reviewed, but it had some interesting visual concepts here that I wanted to borrow from. So you've got um, 3,500 base pairs here on this plasmid, and we've talked about key elements of the plasmid before, your antibiotic resistance and some kind of origin of replication. Here you've got a promoter, and you've got this, uh, I think this was the original gene that was here along with what's called a multiple cloning site. So someone's gonna put an operon in here, probably this one. Um, and, and somewhere downstream of this, but not annotated, are, is a terminator. So if you want to overexpress three different genes, um, and you wanna express them all differently at different strengths, um, if you wanna focus on, on a promoter, you need three different promoters, uh, which means that you also need three different terminators, and you need effectively three different cassettes. Whereas if you um, want to do this uh, more commonly, uh, especially if you generally want them all on at the same time, then just have them under the same promoter. And now you've got the small region in front of, of each of them that is their RBS. And what you see a lot of in the literature is because these RBS regions are small, um, and because of techniques like PCR, where you can, you can effectively amplify each of these genes and then stitch them right back together with some modifications in between, it actually lends itself perfectly to generating a combinatorial library, um, where in this case, at these three different positions, uh, I believe this would be um, you know, three different RBS strengths for each of the three different positions. Three to the third gets you 27. Um, and so you can see that uh, here. And so then if you actually had 27 different plasmids, that's not, for, for many assays, for most assays, that's a, a very reasonable amount to be able to test. Uh, and so you could just sort of do that and you could do it potentially randomly and just see which one wins. Uh, and by that, I mean, you could do it a little randomly in terms of which of these genes some of which may be heterologous, um, you want more or less of. MFA may not give you a good prediction of that because that requires some knowledge about the kinetics of these enzymes that are coming from a different organism. So if you don't have well-characterized kinetics, you don't know relatively how, how active they're going to be. You also don't know how well they might express. So you might need, for example, a stronger RBS for something, a protein that is going to express more poorly. Um, is there some things that you simply wouldn't be able to predict a priori. What you should be able to predict, though, is what are the three different strengths of RBSs that you would use here. Uh, that you should pick quite deliberately and probably vary between weak, medium, and strong. 
um, in, some, in some titrated way. Otherwise, you're just throwing random RBSs and you don't really know what's going on. So, so very few people actually do that now because the RBS prediction tools um, are really excellent, as I, as I will soon show a slide that, that makes that claim. Uh, but in the lead up to that, um, just thinking about this ribosome binding site again, um, it controls how fast the ribosome binds and initiates translation. So this is just depicting a low prediction, production rate. Um, now here it's, it's represented as 35 nucleotides, and we'll talk about whether or not it's, it's really 35 nucleotides, um, but it's illustrated as this dial or knob to be able to change the amount of proteins. And so here, you know, you can imagine uh, a 10x increase in translation initiation, giving you a 10x increase in protein production. Um, so why translation initiation? Uh, at least among the steps of translation, and some of you are, are super well acquainted with the fact that translation involves many steps, and there could be many, many things downstream that you might want to look into. Uh, but usually for translation, uh, transition initiation is, is the rate limiting step. And so what this requires is you've got your mRNA, and then you have, um, you know, some amount of 30S ribosomal subunits, and there's some equilibrium here, but this RNA would rather be bound by a subunit. Um, and so once you get binding of the 30S RNA, then you recruit the 50S RNA, forming what seems to be not the right math, but this is how it works, um, the 70S um, ribosome. Uh, or ribosomal subunit complex, uh, and then you that is functional. You make protein, and then and then it kicks off the ribosome and it splits into its um, parts. So uh, you can do a lot of modeling here, which Howard Salas has done, um, to and and also some others before him um, to to model this as an equilibrium process um, where you've got mRNA. Um, and you can focus in on specifically the part of the mRNA that has the interaction, uh, the concentration of 30S subunits that are free, and uh, that reversibly are the bound 30S subunit. And uh, using your just general uh, principles from therm thermodynamics, you can represent this equilibrium relation with your sort of standard um, you know, exponential function um, with the free energy term. Um, and this starts to dive into how you would do some biophysical modeling. Um, in addition to the modeling, or to, to, to partly make a model, um, you can perform experiments because it's hard to do these um, from first principles when you have to know, okay, what, what features of the 30S ribosomal subunit um, uh, are being bound and, and to what degree is their binding preference and binding association constants. Um, those kind of interactions are, are uh, experimentally measured and fed into a biophysical model. Um, in the meantime, uh, or during, like sort of in the process, you can do surveys of all the existing RBSs. Um, and what there is specifically, um, you know, we can call this RBS also the shine dalgarno sequence. And it's just typically upstream by a few nucleotides, approximately seven of the start codon. It's really rich in purines, AG, and in equali, the, the strong RBS consensus is AGG, AGG. Now, this was a, an image here, um, uh, what's called a web logo. Um, to map consensus nucleotides at each position, um, done on a broader set of E. coli ribosome binding sites than just the strong consensus sequence. So that's why this actually shows a slightly different consensus, but still AG rich. Um, and you can see how, for example, I mean, this shows, uh, this, this map illustrates really nicely that ATG is your most common start codon, um, but occasionally it's GTG. Um, and, and so that reflects what's known. Um, and so you can see how, um, you know, uh, that if I didn't already say this clearly, the height of each letter is, is, um, the, is representative of the proportion or frequency that you see that. Um, 
uh, right. Um, so what else did I want to say here? Oh, yes. So the, the complementary sequence of AGG, AGG um, is what occurs on the ribosomal 16S RNA. And, and so that's really critical. That, that's essentially telling you how this is happening, right? You've got a ribosomal um, con component that has uh, this, because it's also made of, of RNA, um, has this CCU, CCU um, motif, at least in E. coli. And so it makes sense that it would have the tightest um, affinity uh, to AGG, AGG on the, the messenger RNA sequence. Um, I'll pause for any questions here. 